um, I'd like to get started with our presentation today. Um, we're very excited to have a guest presenter today, Dr. Trilochan Sahu. Um, Dr. Sahu began his training in human genetics at Duke University and then completed it at Baylor College of Medicine. He is board certified in clinical cytogenetics. He has worked in director capacity at various diagnostic laboratories prior to joining Combi Matrix in Irvine, California, where he is the VP of Clinical Affairs and Director of Cytogenetics. In addition to being very busy evaluating and signing out clinical cases, Dr. Sahu carves out time for cytogenetic studies, which he presents at conferences worldwide. Uh, and it is a pleasure for Biodiscovery to have him here today to present one of his recent studies on the genetic basis of pregnancy loss. So um, I'm going to hand it over to him so we can get started with the presentation. Dr. Sahu? Uh, thank you, Shalini, and uh, thanks to Biodiscovery for the invite to present some of our uh, recent uh, studies uh, on pregnancy loss. Uh, my disclosure, I'm a full-time employee at uh, Combi Matrix Diagnostics and own stock in the company. So just to set the groundwork for what I'm going to present today, I think it would be appropriate to state that uh, the whole field of genomic disorders has uh, unraveled uh, itself and continues to do so. And over the last uh, decade and a half, we have come to recognize the importance of human genome copy number variation in both health and disease. Rearrangements of our genome can be responsible for inherited as well as uh, sporadic traits, Mendelian disorders, many complex disorders such as uh, neurobehavioral phenotypes. Although traditionally chromosomal aneuploidy accounts for the majority of imbalance, unbalanced structural aberrations contribute uh, to a significant fraction of what we uh, identify or recognize as uh, genomic disorders. The powerful tools that we have today have uh, allowed us to interrogate the genome at a genome-wide level and that has resulted in the identification of uh, previously unrecognized uh, structural cytogenetic uh, aberrations which are often associated with uh, genetic syndromes. Additionally, we now have a uh, much better understanding about the underlying mechanisms that uh, come into play resulting in uh, various types of uh, genomic disorders. So basically the numerous genomics or whole genome or genome wide tools that we have uh, today have uh, uh, greatly enhanced our ability to both diagnose as well as discover a vast array of genomic disorders. One of the most powerful tools that has uh, empowered us to achieve uh, this discovery and uh, diagnostic uh, results are uh, chromosomal microarrays, which essentially have transformed chromosome analysis into a DNA-based uh, discipline. Uh, as a member of the Combi Matrix Diagnostics team, I just wanted to state that uh, we are a leading uh, U.S. provider of uh, chromosomal microarray services for a variety of uh, clinical um, problems such as miscarriage analysis, invasive prenatal diagnosis, pediatric uh, developmental disorders, and we do provide next-gen sequencing based uh, assays for pre-implantation genetic screening. So essentially, we are very fortunate that we have harnessed the power of uh, genome-wide uh, tools to uh, evaluate uh, um, the genome at uh, a continuum of time points uh, during human development, that is uh, at conception, during pregnancy, in the newborn period, and uh, uh, at the pediatric uh, age group. So chromosomal microarray analysis in clinical diagnosis uh, um, essentially uh, needs the use of uh, two very important uh, uh, components. One is uh, to have a, a good whole genome microarray platform and uh, to complement that you need a robust uh, software to both analyze and evaluate uh, genomic copy number variation. So just like many labs uh, over the, across the world, we have evolved over the years and uh, uh, 
um, have uh, gone on from back area CGH to oligonucleotide based uh, area CGH and currently for the last five years we have uh, been a sole user of SNP based arrays and the platform that we use are the Illumina Cytosnip 850K or the uh, Cytosnip 12 which has a, a 300K platform. What this uh, platforms um, uh, allow us uh, is to evaluate the genome at a very high resolution uh, so as to achieve uh, uh, detection of copy number variation at almost uh, 20 kb resolution. Additionally, because this platform is uh, ba ba based on uh, SNPs, it allows us to detect uh, additional uh, genomic aberrations such as polyploidy, regions of hemozygosity or uniparental disomy and particularly important for uh, miscarriage samples that we are going to discuss today, the element of maternal cell contamination. A very powerful or a very important uh, benefit of using uh, SNP arrays is the ability to uh, evaluate uh, samples that have been fixed in formalin and embedded in paraffin. So, in addition to having a robust uh, uh, microarray platform, you need uh, uh, excellent software that, uh, you know, facilitates evaluation and interpretation of uh, genomic data. And we have been, uh, you know, very happy or satisfied users of Biodiscovery's uh, uh, Nexus uh, uh, group of softwares, first clinical uh, Nexus copy number and more recently the Nexus clinical softwares. And we are currently uh, in the testing phase of the latest version of the Nexus clinical software. So what this allows us to do as a single platform uh, to uh, combine both the analysis of the data and interpretation of uh, the data uh, from the current microarray platforms and uh, allows us scalability to uh, future additional platforms. Uh, this software, in our opinion, is uh, extremely stable, robust, and we have customized it in some ways uh, for uh, our diagnostic requirements, and it has uh, seamlessly been integrated into our laboratory workflow. It uh, is a, a really a great and comprehensive uh, uh, software uh, platform for our case review and reporting system you know, on a daily basis. And importantly, it allows us to capture uh, all the data that we generate on a daily basis uh, into specific databases that can be um, reviewed or um, evaluated at any point in time. So the SNP-based platform that we use, the Illumina 850K or the Cytosnet 12, uh, essentially computes uh, the data from uh, SNPs across the entire genome and provides two very valuable pieces of information and that is copy number and the genotype data or the PLL frequency. So the copy number data allows us to interrogate uh, copy number losses and gains and the PLL frequency or the genotype data uh, complements uh, uh, or uh, supports copy number losses and gains as well as allows us to identify copy neutral uh, uh, regions of homozygosity, UPD, polyploidy and um, maternal cell contamination. This is just an example to show how the data is actually reflected real time when we evaluate the data we using uh, Nexus uh, Clinical. So when there is a deletion, you see the log R ratio, which is a reflection of the copy number showing an appropriate negative shift. When there is a duplication of a genomic region, you see the appropriate positive uh, log R ratio shift. And uh, copy neutral regions uh, show the normal profile. And this deletion or duplication or the normal regions are also reflected in the BLL profile as a loss of the AB uh, genotypes when there is a deletion or a transformation of the AB genotypes into additional uh, uh, separate profiles when there is a duplication. So it's extremely powerful both the platform and the uh, software tools that we use to capture uh, these uh, events across the entire genome. 
So it's very important that the software tools that we use provide uh, us information uh, for any specific genomic alteration in the context of multiple other uh, information databases, both private as well as public. So that allows us to uh, evaluate the significance of a copy number alteration in the terms of uh, the genomic position on any specific chromosome, the gene content overlap with uh, uh, clinically recognized or well-defined syndromic regions and so on and so forth. So it is very valuable that we have all these resources integrated into a, a, a single, single platform that facilitates evaluation of clinical data. So now I'll switch videos to actually share with you our uh, five-year experience uh, uh, evaluating uh, pregnancy loss. The genetics of pregnancy loss has been studied uh, at a uh, relatively low scale compared to other genomic disorders. We know that human conception and pregnancy is a very robust as well as uh, extremely vulnerable process and it's uh, well recognized that about uh, 15 to 20 percent of clinically recognized pregnancies eventually result in a loss. The most common etiology which is well recognized is uh, genetic, uh, most often numerical and structural chromosomal abnormalities. A definitive cause uh, a genetic cause is often very difficult to achieve because of the nature of the samples that we get when there is a uh, pregnancy loss or miscarriage. They are very challenging sometimes and uh, if one follows conventional um, cytogenetic uh, methods, uh, the failure rate is uh, extremely high because of the nature of the sample. Additionally, the the implementation or the adoption of uh, whole genome chromosomal microarrays for pregnancy loss has been sub somewhat uh, uh, subdued and um, uh, a more cautious uh, stage because uh, there have been no clear cut recommendations uh, as to uh, what uh, best diagnostic tests uh, should be for for uh, evaluation of pregnancy loss. Uh, the next uh, rest of the talk will revolve around our data that we have uh, uh, captured from for over the last five years or so. So we uh, probably uh, can claim to be one of the largest providers of uh, microarray services for uh, recurrent and uh, pregnancy loss. So the data I'll present today is from a little over 13,000 samples that we have received. Uh, we received over, the, over a five-year period and successfully analyzed and resulted uh, a little over 12,000 such samples. Now, the, the data I'm going to show you today is uh, a significant extension of the da data that uh, was just published uh, a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, so of the 13,555 samples that we received, uh, as you can see, a vast majority were fresh, uh, a significant fraction were um, formalin fixed paraffin embedded, and uh, a small subset uh, included cell culture, DNA, etc. And um, our success rate uh, is, uh, in our opinion, quite impressive in that we can uh, achieve uh, great results in over 91% uh, of fresh samples, over 83% of FFP samples, and close to 98% of other sample types. So we do have a success rate of approximately 91% uh, mm. overall, which if compared to conventional cytogenetic analysis of miscarriage samples is uh, extremely impressive. So most of our samples uh, uh, over this uh, period were evaluated by the SNP-based uh, uh, Illumina microarrays, both the 850K and the SNP-12. Uh, the reasons for referral for most of the samples uh, fall, uh, fell into you know, expected groups, recurrent pregnancy loss and uh, spontaneous abortions uh, 
encompassed uh, over 80% of the samples and close to 10% of the samples uh, were from stale birth or intrauterine fetal death. The median age for our patients was 34 years and uh, slightly above that for uh, patients in whose who samples we actually got abnormal results. So the next couple of slides are very important because they reflect uh, you know, the results that we obtained which is very valuable for our patients. So of the 12,324 uh, 12, sam samples that we uh, successfully analyzed, about 54% of them gave abnormal results, 44% were normal, and in 2% of cases we identified variants of uh, uncertain significance. Now it's important to state that uh, the normal results had a equivalent distribution for both male and female uh, gender because uh, as we can imagine and as I'll show later on, maternal cell contamination is a very big challenge for a significant fraction of uh, miscarriage samples and uh, the, the risk of uh, having um, excessive maternal tissue or contamination with maternal tissue often compromises uh, the results. So uh, equivalent distribution of both genders in the normal sample set is uh, a reflection of the fact that uh, their maternal cell contamination was not often not very confounding in majority of the samples. So. Um, it's also important to note that uh, the abnormality rate in fresh or non-FFP samples was slightly higher than uh, that seen in FFP samples. And uh, the abnormality rate, whether it was recurrent pregnancy loss or spontaneous abortion, was almost equivalent. Whereas in cases where of IUFT or fetal demise or stillbirth, the abnormality rate was uh, uh, around 15 percent. This is a very crowded slide but it uh, encompasses uh, um, a vast amount of data analyzing every single, every single abnormality type that can be uh, detected by uh, whole genome SNP based chromosomal microarrays. And uh, as you can see, the list of abnormalities that we can detect is, uh, is as broad as we can achieve at this point in time with these platforms. So the three most common uh, types of abnormalities were trisomies, both uh, single and multiple trisomies, monosomy X and uh, triploidy. Then we had uh, multiple other abnormality types such as uh, uh, deletions and duplications, uh, terminal deletions and duplications suggestive of uh, unbalanced translocation, uh, small percentage of uniparental di disomy, so on and so forth. And we, uh, we uh, conclude that about 91% uh, uh, of uh, uh, all abnormalities uh, uh, encompass these three groups and uh, these are uh, undoubtedly causative of the pregnancy loss. Now as I said in the previous slide, trisomies were uh, you know single or multiple uh, were the most common uh, abnormalities on 65 percent of uh, the uh, abnormalities that we observe. And of these as uh, one would expect chromosome 16 or trisomy for chromosome 16 remains the most common, uh, followed by chromosome 22, 21, chromosome 15, etc. But uh, it's important to note that the, the data for trisomies for many other chromosomes is unavailable, uh, you know, from traditional techniques. Uh, and we have uh, observed trisomy for almost every chromosome except chromosome 1 and uh, uh, probably chromosome 19. So this is a comparison of uh, more classical uh, um, traditional data to show that uh, autosomal trisomies are actually 
um, identifiable at a frequency higher than uh, traditionally thought of. Now, for the next few slides, I'm going to give you some examples. I'll show you some actual uh, examples of cases that uh, we have uh, observed and reported both uh, common as well as uh, not so common uh, in frequency. Uh, this is a key example of uh, the most common abnormal magnitude that is uh, trisomy 16, where you can see uh, the value of having a, a really good uh, microarray platform as well as uh, robust software to evaluate uh, very sensitive uh, and specific uh, uh, abnormalities. Just an example, zoomed in view for chromosome 16 showing uh, gain in copy number across the entire chromosome uh, reflected uh, uh, appropriately in the BLL profile. This is another very common uh, abnormality, uh, monosomy X, where a uh, single copy for the X chromosome. I also mentioned in uh, one of the earlier slides that uh, multiple trisomies uh, encompass about 3% of uh, uh, all the abnormalities that we have identified. And this is an example of uh, a case with uh, uh, triple aneuploid that is trisomy for chromosomes 9, 11, and uh, 20. Complex abnormalities are uh, not uncommon and uh, can be of various types and include uh, a large segmental aneuploidies as well as uh, a, a smaller uh, segmental aneuploidies uh, and uh, a segmental UPD. This is an example of a case where you see a deletion on chromosome 11, a terminal duplication or triplication uh, which appears to be mosaic in nature for chromosome 12. Then you have a complex rearrangement involving chromosome 18. So the chromosome 12 terminal abnormality is likely a, 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 a triplication which appears mosaic in nature from the log R value and the genotype profile. And the abnormality involving chromosome 18 in this case uh, is reflected as a gain for the majority of the chromosome and a deletion of the distal uh, long arm of chromosome 18 with a normal copy number segment in between, which uh, suggests it's a pretty complex uh, structural abnormality and uh, likely the cause of the pregnancy loss. Unbalanced translocations uh, uh, carried uh, uh, by, from, you know, resulting uh, from parents who carry a balanced form of a translocation are also uh, seen quite frequently. And uh, this is an example of uh, uh, potential unbalanced translocation between chromosomes 4P and uh, 14Q and uh, raises the possibility of uh, one of the parents having a balanced form of this uh, uh, rearrangement uh, which of course increases the risk of a similar unfortunate events happening in future pregnancies. This is just a zoomed in view of the duplication of terminal 4, 4P and the deletion of uh, terminal 14Q. Other segments of course uh, are quite large in size and likely contributed very significantly to the pregnancy loss. As I mentioned uh, in, uh, in one of the opening slides, uh, the benefits of having a, a, a genome-wide or all-genome SNP-based platform, and that is the ability to detect a polyploidy and uh, um, uh, a couple of other types of abnormalities that may not be obvious by other additional uh, or other tools. So this is a case of uh, triploidy with uh, three X chromosomes and uh, no Y chromosome. As you can see, the copy number profile is not suggestive of a change because the uh, gain for the entire genome or chromosomes 1 to 22 and X chromosome are normalized to two copies. However, the BLL frequency shows 
uh, reflects again for every chromosome, including chromosome X. So this is a typical uh, profile that uh, one sees uh, when there is a triploidy. Triploidy uh, is often confounded by, uh, you know, additional uh, gain or loss of chromosomes uh, resulting in hypo or hypertriploidy. And this case is an example of a, tri a triploid uh, 70XXX with an extra copy or tetrasomy for uh, chromosome 6. Another uh, huge advantage of using uh, your SNP based uh, whole genome arrays is the ability to identify regions of homozygosity, UPT, etc. And uh, uniparental isodisomy for the entire genome is uh, uh, a pathognomonic feature of uh, molar pregnancies. And what you see here is uh, two copies of uh, the entire genome, uh, including the X chromosome, no Y chromosome, but you see uh, allelic homozygosity for the entire genome, which is uh, uh, the classical pathognomonic feature of uh, uh, molar pregnancy resulting from uh, duplication of uh, sperm uh, fertilizing a nullisomic egg. In addition to the abnormalities that uh, we identify that are uh, either causative or potentially contribute to uh, pregnancy loss, we often identify, um, as I showed in one of the earlier slides, uh, deletions uh, and duplications, either uh, just uh, as a single event or superimposed upon uh, uh, a more uh, significant abnormality. And uh, sometimes the importance or significance of identifying these uh, uh, smaller or uh, less non-causative uh, abnormalities is very significant because of the potential for impacting future pregnancies. So this is an example of a triploid 69XXX uh, uh, genomic profile that uh, resulted in the pregnancy loss. However, in addition to the causative uh, abnormality, there is what appears to be a, a heterozygous loss of uh, a segment on 17 um, um, P that uh, overlaps a very important uh, syndromic disorder that is a uh, um, hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure policies. So this is these are aberrations that we identify. Confounding a triplet pregnancy is slightly uh, not contributory to the current pregnancy loss, but it is of very significant value when uh, uh, the couple has a successful pregnancy in the future and would require either prenatal diagnosis. Yeah, um, and uh, appropriate counseling. So the value, this is just an example of the immense value of not only identifying the cause of a pregnancy loss, but uh, capturing additional data that uh, is of uh, a extreme value for uh, future successful pregnancies. However, it's uh, important to mention that despite the strengths of many of the tools that we have at our disposal today, there remain significant uh, challenges uh, uh, despite that. You know, whether we talk of chromosomal microarrays or next-gen sequencing or whatsoever. And particularly when we talk of uh, handling or evaluating uh, miscarriage samples, one of the most challenging features is the uh, suboptimal nature of the sample in many, many cases. So we, because of, you know, the large number of cases that we uh, get to evaluate on a 
a continual basis, we see samples of all types and that is to be expected. Samples can be really good where you can actually um, get very clean chorionic villi to do a whole genome microarray or you know you can get clean fetal parts or you can get um, paraffin sections where the majority of the sample um, sections are of fetal origin. Additionally, very frequently we can get samples that are extremely compromised in having overwhelming maternal uh, residual tissue or you know very bloody in nature or paraffin sections where the fetal components are extremely minimal in amount. So what this does is it uh, of course compromises uh, our ability to provide uh, uh, identify abnormality or provide a diagnosis. So this is an example of uh, uh, apparently normal fetus of male gender where uh, there's almost 40% uh, um, contribution from maternal cells. That's our uh, you know, conservative estimate. And in the cases like this, it's very difficult uh, to say that this uh, uh, sample does not harbor any um, you know, identifiable genomic abnormalities. All that we can say is that because of the presence of Y, that this is uh, a male fetus. But uh, even though maternal cell contamination and suboptimal sample can be very challenging, they uh, are often detectable despite the suboptimal nature. And this is just to reflect the benefit of having an uh, excellent uh, whole genome microarray platform and the appropriate uh, uh, software tools to evaluate and interpret. And this is an example of uh, female fetus with almost 50% of the genome being contributed by the mother. However, there is evidence both from the copy number profile and the genotype profile suggestive of uh, trisomy for chromosome 16. So despite the challenges, we have over the years uh, gained uh, significant experience in being able to provide uh, appropriate diagnosis um, uh, uh, in the midst of um, you know, significant maternal cell contamination. We have actually, because of the sensitive uh, nature of the microarray platform that we use, uh, been able to uh, sort of catalog uh, the uh, frequency with which we see maternal cell contamination. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we have um, uh, noted or cataloged uh, MC maternal cell contamination in over half of our cases. And it's only in a small fraction that we see uh, maternal cell contamination of 10% or more. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to make a brief mention of uh, the cases where we do not um, or are not able to provide uh, results, which is approximately 9% of our cases. And uh, most often it is because, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, the samples are uh, really poor in quality and we are unable to achieve uh, um, or obtain adequate amounts of fetal tissue and subsequently DNA. This is another example of um, how, because of the platform as well as the software, we can still go ahead and provide a diagnosis uh, um, in the midst of um, um, having a significantly compromised samples. So uh, as you can see that um, this BLL profile is reflective of significant maternal cell contamination, which we estimate to be about 25%, but however, uh, we also notice the profile which is strongly suggestive of a triploid uh, 69XXX uh, uh, abnormality. So in conclusion, I just wanted to restate some of the facts that I have tried to share with you today and that is that uh, 
uh, chromosomal microarrays with uh, the advantages of having robust analytical tools, uh, uh, particularly microarrays and uh, softwares, are very successful in evaluation of fresh and FFP POC samples and provide a diagnosis in, uh, for a vast majority of our patients. A wide range and variety of numerical and structural abnormalities uh, uh, that we have identified uh, uh, complement uh, what has traditionally been known as uh, you know, contributing to pregnancy loss in over 50 percent of the uh, cases. And because of the large sample set and the variety of abnormalities that we have been able to identify and catalog, we uh, would like to state that uh, we are currently or we currently have a much better understanding of the spectrum as well as the frequency of specific uh, common as well as not so common abnormalities that contribute to pregnancy loss. And it is our, our hope that uh, professional um, recommendations uh, would uh, uh, push for chromosomal microarrays uh, to become the first year diagnostic test for uh, miscarriage analysis of any gestational age so that um, we can harness the power of these technologies and provide answers to most of our patients and their families dealing with pregnancy loss and uh, in search of answers. I would like to end by uh, acknowledging many, many of uh, my talented colleagues uh, who contribute significantly uh, to provide answers to our patients and their families on a daily basis. Thank you and uh, love to take questions. Okay, so um, do you need to validate CMA results by a second method? If so, which? Uh, we usually do not validate uh, the CMA results with um, a second method, except in the rare cases where we are, you know, have questions about, uh, you know, the um, legitimacy of a finding, and if the samples are extremely compromised, and if they are amenable to a second testing, such as fish or um, karyotype. But it's uh, rarely a need for us to uh, evaluate by a second method. Great, thank you. Uh, but uh, I you should mention that uh, in those rare cases where we expect uh, or uh, have a suspicion of uh, tetraploidy, that is one situation where we always try to confirm because the genomic profile of uh, cases with tetraploidy is not obvious, uh, like what you see in uh, triploidy. Great, and thank you. And that's only possible for fresh samples. Okay, thanks. Um, that was actually uh, the next question. Um, how can you detect tetrapoids? Um, yeah, uh, th that's, uh, that's uh, very <laughs> challenging. And uh, you know, if if there is equivalent contribution for, of uh, two haploid genomes from the um, two parents, then it's uh, very uh, challenging. It's uh, subtle differences in you know the BLL profile or you know rarely in the logger that raises a flag, and it's only then that we suspect. And uh, the few cases is actually a handful of cases where where we have actually suspected tetraploidy our suspicions have been confirmed by um, by fish so i wish i had uh, you know a case to show you where we actually detected the uh, tetraploidy based on our suspicion but uh, it is it is an, uh, a challenge uh, but at the same time the frequency of tetraploidy is uh, extremely low um great and then continuing with that question um it was uh, given that 50% of first trimester miscarriage samples are gene genetically abnormal, majority being trisomic. Do you feel CMA provides value over QF-PCR? Uh, well, uh, yes and no. If, if so the limitation of QF-PCR is only that much or that many types of uh, um, abnormalities or trisomies that you can interrogate. 
So what if it is a rare case of trisomy 2 or trisomy 7 or you know trisomy you know 17 and if you do not have a panel that uh, covers many of these uh, less frequent uh, um, trisomies then obviously you have a risk of having a false negative result and uh, so QF-PCR probably is economical and can achieve results in a, in a majority of cases, but still, uh, in our opinion, we should aim to achieve as much diagnostic power and detection rates as possible. And I think at this point in time, chromosomal microarrays uh, serve that purpose to a great extent. Great. Thank you. Um, do you think CMA will remain the gold standard as NGS is becoming more popular? Well, for again, it's our opinion from our experience over the last many years uh, dealing with uh, such a large number and large variety of samples. We we hope at least that it will remain the gold standard for uh, the immediate future. Uh, because of the nature of the samples in um, uh, in a significant fraction of cases where they are compromised either by maternal tissue or by you know uh, non-fetal um, elements, so their next-gen sequencing becomes uh, of which I'm presuming is the upcoming uh, platform and becomes. Uh, uh, very very challenging to achieve the type of degree to which we can achieve results by chromosomal microarrays. You now the sensitivity and specificity in the presence of confounding factors such as maternal cell contamination or compromised samples still remains very high and um, I'm sure that uh, that will probably be achieved by uh, next-gen sequencing or other platforms in the future but uh, that's uh, to be seen. Great, thank you. Um, can you describe your PGS service? Yeah, so we have been providing uh, implantation genetic screening for chromosomal uh, aneuploidies and uh, abnormalities for the last uh, uh, over two years. And currently we uh, use the Illumina VeriSeq uh, next-gen sequencing based, uh, based uh, platform uh, using uh, that provides a low pass uh, sequencing across the um, entire genome and we are extremely happy with the sensitivity and specificity of the results that we are obtaining with uh, this NGS based platform and it, we feel it is a significant improvement over uh, the uh, previous uh, um, RACGH uh, platform that was based uh, on uh, back arrays. So we have uh, over uh, close to 5,000 embryos that we have analyzed and uh, we see uh, abnormalities and again close to 50% of samples. But uh, the most uh, striking uh, finding that we have observed uh, from PGS uh, samples is that the, the uh, the types of abnormalities are significantly different from what we see in the pregnancy loss or uh, newborns or pediatric samples. And just just to mention one important point is that monosomies for individual chromosomes is one of the mo most common findings in PGS uh, samples, which is uh, starkly uh, different from what we observe in pregnancy loss or other time points uh, during which we evaluate for genomic abnormalities. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned you've used other arrays before you used the Illumina array. What software were you using? That's a good question. Uh, I think we have used uh, biodiscoveries for quite a few years and uh, the oligo arrays that we were using was from Agilent and uh, um, that's a tough way because I am more recent to uh, combi metrics for the last three years, so <laughs> I will have to get back on that. 
but I'm presuming it was either in-house or uh, the software provided uh, by Agilent for the Oligoware CGH. Uh, would you ever report triploid e with greater than 10% MCC, maternal contamination? Triploid e with greater than 10% MCC? Correct. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because, uh, you know, triploid e, whether it's uh, 16 xxx or XXY, as you know, as as I showed in uh, examples, uh, it's got a very classic uh, genomic profile uh, for the B allele um, profile. So uh, it, it, it is very unusual to for the profile to be compromised when there is a MCC of 10 percent or so. When the MCC rises significantly higher, so 40, 50, or more than that percentage, then it becomes challenging. But again, uh, we have now achieved, uh, you know, significant experience uh, in dealing with such compromised samples, and we have done uh, in vitro experiments uh, using actual pure triploid samples and um, adding uh, DNA to that and seeing how the profile, the allele profile changes, and that has uh, influenced. Uh, our uh, ability to provide uh, triploid uh, abnormal results uh, even in the presence of significant amount of MCC. So a 10% MCC is, uh, you know, is less of a challenge than when it is much, much higher. Great, thank you. Um, how can you tell if the molar pregnancy sample is haploid versus homozygous diploid? Uh, homozygous diploid uh, means uh, if there is dispermy, again that is uh, very rare, uh, we, but we have uh, identified uh, I think a couple of cases where the molar pregnancy is because of dispermy and then again that has a signature because of the uh, uh, crossovers between the uh, two uh, haploid genomes from the two individual uh, sperms. So that again, unfortunately, I, you know, because of time, I did not have um, a chance to include that data. But yes, the, it is it is a, a suspicion which, uh, because of the DLL profile pattern, but it's very difficult to confirm. Um, but I should mention and emphasize that uh, uh, classical molar pregnancy is what I showed you, where there's a clean homozygosity across the entire genome. But if it is molar, uh, the outcome is a molar pregnancy because of um, the two haploid genomes from dispermy, then the pattern is a little different. And uh, we have recognized that, um, and but it remains unconfirmed. Great, thank you. Um, and well, what databases do you use for your interpretation? So uh, we actually uh, have, um, you know, used the standard array of, uh, of uh, publicly available databases so just such as, you know, particularly for the gene, uh, gene distribution across the genome. And uh, now there are, you know, a vast array of such databases one can use to evaluate the significance of a finding in the context of, you know, gene content, etc. And there are morbid maps uh, for, you know, disease-associated regions uh, uh, across the genome. And we have our own private database uh, that we have generated across, over the years that we consider significant. Uh, um, in terms of uh, overlap with, uh, you know, critical genes or doses sensitive genes or, you know, syndromic regions um, that uh, uh, result from loss or gain of uh, dose sensitive genes. And uh, one important aspect of uh, the way we handle data that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is uh, a um, big advantage of using software like Nexus Clinical from Biodiscovery is our ability to capture every um, CNV event uh, across sample types for future um, review or retrieval. 
So very often we see rare CNVs and we can um, instantaneously in real time go and evaluate if we have seen any such CNV uh, in the past and uh, what the sample type was, what the thinking or our interpretation was and so on and so forth. So yes, so it's mostly public databases as well as our own private uh, uh, ongoing capture of data. Great, thank you.